Hey, all out there. This is Haley Murr, uh, the Director of Strategic Partnerships and Development at Murr Ranch Group. Welcome to our Land Bulletin series, where every other week we discuss ranch and sporting property market, buying and selling advice, the latest best stewardship practices, as well as topics currently impacting landowners. Uh, Murr Ranch Group, for those of you who are just tuning in, is a full service ranch real estate brokerage and consulting company focusing on legacy ranches and sporting and conservation properties around the West. Uh, today, um, we're going to actually be talking about something that's near and dear to my heart, to a lot of our brokers here at Murr Ranch Group's heart and to my family. We're gonna be talking about what Western art has done to preserve the West, which current artists are on the rise and how one can start to curate their own collection and support this, this type of art. Um, thank you to everyone who have submitted questions. We'll try to get to them on this broadcast, but if not, We'll reach out to you separately and answer them directly. Helping me out today is someone who is an expert in Western art and actually the recipient of the 2023 Mary Bell Grant Award, the curator of the Coors, Coors Western Art Show, Rose Frederick. Without further ado, here's Rose. <laughs> hey, Rose. Hey, Haley. Thanks for joining us today. I'm so excited for next week and for the Coors Show in general. It's going to be really fun. Thanks for having me on. I, I really appreciate um, having the chance to talk to people about Western art. So, yay. Yeah, especially this is great. <laughs> especially, um, especially our living Western artists, too. I think people really um, ha have this idea in their head of uh, Remington and Russell, Charlie Russell. And uh, there's a lot of really amazing work that's that's going on today that that is um very different than that, that really speaks to what's happening in the West as we know it today mm -hmm. with our issues that are happening with us. So anyway, it's great to be able yeah. to talk to people about it. No, it's great. And I, I even since I've been going to the course show and I've been going to the course show, course show since you've been a curator, you can see how art has even changed in that amount of time span. So to, yeah. to really see how art has come from when people started coming out West to today is really special. So we're excited yeah. to learn more and, and to pick your brain. Um, but I guess we'll, we'll start just kind of from what you were talking about is, you know, historically, what have we learned from the West? I know you've spoken to me at length about a few, you know, specific artists, um, but kind of what created this Western art frontier? What kind of brought these artists out West and what did we learn from them once they got here? Yeah, right. You know, it's really interesting. Um, and I think just knowing that we have a limited amount of time and I could blather on about the history of Western art for days, but let me just jump right in with Thomas Moran. And we have some gorgeous Thomas Moran paintings at the Denver Art Museum. Um, the Smithsonian Museum of American Art has these seminal Thomas Moran of um, Yellowstone. And why I'm bringing up Thomas Moran is because in 1871, he was invited to go on the Hayden Survey. And the Hayden Survey, as a lot of people who know their history of the West, was mapping um, Yellowstone. And so what had happened is um, he was given some very bad sketches when, when, he, when Thomas Moran was in New York and he was making, he was doing illustrations for Scribner's Magazine. And that really piqued his curiosity of what this land was. And at the time, if you've ever been to Yellowstone, imagine trying to explain Yellowstone to somebody who had no idea, you know, and they would just say, that doesn't exist, you're a liar, which is what was happening. And Thomas Moran was so taken with this idea that he actually paid for his own travel to come out West yeah. and join the Hayden survey with William Henry Jackson, the photographer that I know a lot of folks know of, um, who was shooting with one of these huge box cameras, schlepping this heavy, heavy gear glass plates and taking photos of this uncharted land. It wow. was a really <laughs> difficult journey to get there. There were no roads in, you know, and so here they are with pack mules and schlepping their own gear. Thomas Moran made hundreds of sketches and watercolors of this Amazing. land in Yellowstone. 
he took them back to New York and um, got on the train, went back to New York and in his studio created a painting that was basically seven feet tall, 12 feet wide. Wow. Of, yes. Yes. <laughs> of, <laughs> of Yellowstone. And he call, they call it the Grand Canyon of Yellowstone. And you can see that painting in the Smithsonian. That painting was put before Congress. Thomas Moran was there, William Henry Jackson, and um, the head of the Corps of Engineers, um, Captain Hiram Chittenden. And they told Congress, you have to set this land aside. You cannot wow. let it be developed. It has to be held in, um, in public land so that everyone in future generations can enjoy this land. So, um, <laughs> you know, I, I always love this because artists pave the way so often. And Thomas Moran really paved the way. And that is the first national park in the world that mm. Thomas Moran, William Henry Jackson, and, and a few people who really had the foresight to stand before Congress and say, we've got to preserve this for people to come. That's incredible. That's such yeah. a, I mean, we're even out there with our cameras trying to capture things and and evoke yeah. that. So the fact that he was able to do that through art is incredible. Um, and I'll, yeah. I'll make sure that after this, we send out links to some of those so people can get an idea of who these artists are that you're going to be talking about today, including Thomas Moran. Yeah. Um, but along with him, I know you were talking about kind of the genesis of the, the moving west of a lot of these artists after him. Um, you were talking about World War One and Mm -hmm. uh, kind of what inspired that that Western movement of some of the artists that created this industry and this marketplace in Colorado. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, this is an interesting thing that I think a lot of people don't know, but but people know Frederick Remington's work. And again, mm -hmm. the, the Denver Art Museum has some of his seminal pieces, definitely just the amazing bronzes um, that he did. What people don't really know is when Frederick Remington came out West, the West was already becoming settled. The mm -hmm. West that he wanted to paint and envision no longer existed. So, for example, when you see paintings of trappers and, and you see this sort of rugged lifestyle, well, a lot of the West, by the time he got out here, there were barbed wires and, you know, and land was sort of parceled off. And so, and, and Frederick Remington actually had kind of a short-lived career in a sense, um, because when he went back to his New York studio to paint, this new movement was starting to come in from, from Europe that had a more contemporary, modern way of, not contemporary, really, but just more of a modern expressionist way of looking at things. And his very German, um, way of painting these grander than life um, scenes and landscapes that became out of vogue. And he really um, died as not a well thought of artist at the time. Now we think much more highly of his work. Um, mm -hmm. But but just to sort of put things in context, the West was settled. Uh, you know, you don't think of it, but it wasn't these Indian encampments and things like that, that, that we see and that there are artists still today who are painting that, that was really killed off and gone by the time mm -hmm. Remington came out. So, um, so for me as a curator, um, and I certainly don't mean to cast dispersions on Remington, he's a fantastic painter. Um, and he really captured the grandiosity of the West. And, and again, mm -hmm. a lot of people in the East just couldn't even fathom what it was right. like out here, these mountains and, and, and not all, the beauty of it, but how arduous it was just to get here and then to have a life out here. Um, but what happened in the history of the West is artists were drawn out here just, you know, just like um, people who are seeking their fortune in gold mines, mm -hmm. um, you know, all of that kind of stuff that was happening out here. And it was the Wild West. Right. And, and so anybody who just wanted to break away from that high society and what was happening in the East, the West held all these promises. 
and so there are stories in in some of these artist diaries of you know their um stagecoach being attacked and you know fighting off the just different you know robbers and all kinds of stuff going on so um it, it they're really kind of wild stories but they happened um mm -hmm. along with that so we the world war one and um a lot of people came out here because of the air and the climate was supposed to be so much better for people who are suffering from tuberculosis mm -hmm. and so now parts of colorado started to be settled um you know and there were these clinics and and places where people could come and rest and heal um here and in arizona uh so that started those people who came out were society people they brought out artists they brought out opera singers they brought out musicians they brought writers you know so here's this wild wild west um that the people in the east said well i can't possibly be here without tosca tonight so <laughs> yeah. you know so so they're so bringing, why not bring him with you <laughs> exactly let's bring let's bring the whole cast and crew with us um, so so a lot of culture came to colorado and the west that way what happened is um along with it those artists and musicians and writers and all that they were the people who started, for example, the Denver Art Museum, who started the Colorado Springs Fine Art Center, who started the art program at the University of Denver, at, at University of Colorado, at you know um, all of the universities and the programs that we have here in Colorado today that we you know just assume are you know kind of part and parcel, but those were really seminal programs. Um, and a, an interesting thing that I think a lot of people who love history enjoy learning about is that the GI Bill after World War II allowed artists who were stationed here in the Springs or anywhere around Colorado for part of their tour of duty, it allowed them to stay here. And mm -hmm. they could go to college for free and take whatever coursework they wanted to. And a lot of them took uh, when it wanted to resume their art career. And so places like Colorado Springs Fine Arts Center, they brought in the top artists of the day. So all the big named artists that we know about in New York traveled through here. Um, and so, so as Colorado became more settled and Thomas Moran just grew in more and more fame in what he was doing. And those Yellowstone paintings really completely launched his career. Mm -hmm. um, Thomas Moran came back out here and he painted with our Colorado painters. Um, and so you'll see like Charles Partridge Adams is an artist a lot of people out here know. Helen Henderson Chain and a number of those artists they got a big boost from Thomas Moran and other artists from the East Coast. So what those East Coast artists did and what we were able to do here in Colorado was create some of the most uh, well thought of art programs and art training here. So when you're so looking, neat. yeah. So when you're looking at the history of art um, and it's why I love to talk about Western art in particular, because I think people get stuck in Indians and teepees and trappers and that, um, that was such a tiny sliver of Western art. And, mm -hmm. and if people can kind of step back from that and take this bigger view of art in the Western United States, what they will see is that we were not following behind. We were at the forefront here in the West and specifically Colorado of art movements, um, abstract expressionism, cubism, Dadaism, um, all kinds of art forms. You know, artists were coming out here and really exploring, you know, and so you get artists who were inspired by frankly, a lot of artists who were able to escape Nazi Germany, 
um, mm -hmm. and get to the United States and bring with them what was happening in Europe, which was farther advanced than what was happening here. So that exposure migrated its way in the West. And what people did was take those concepts and use the Western subject matter to create- That's amazing. Yeah, to create really completely unique art of the Western United States. And with a, that, I mean, it's this, it's a, it seems like it's just a melt. I mean, even today it's turned into a melting pot because it's just this place what people want to be. It's yep. the subject matter. It's the mountains. I'm up in steamboat right now. Like I woke up this morning and I was like, I could be a painter and do this, but right, right. I mean, it is, it's pretty neat. And when people do think about fine art, they tend to think of Europe. They tend to think of some of these highbrow societal artists, right. but to know that a lot of those artists were coming here too and creating these incredible programs that exist today is mm -hmm. really neat. And I'm sure a lot of kind of the new artists that you like to highlight um, have taken a lot of inspiration from some of those first, I don't want to call them settlers because they weren't necessarily that, but yep. some of those first uh, pioneers of Western art. So what are some of the, the new players in the game who have taken some of that inspiration that we you were talking about just now um, mm -hmm. and have uh, done it in their own platforms. You know, I love to point people to Don Stinson. Okay. Um, and um, Don is somebody who's really worth looking up. Um, he has done, in fact, one of a number of my favorite paintings of Don's um, are taking a look at the um, um, de-embarkment point where Thomas Moran got off the train at Green River um, in Wyoming and then started into uh, with the survey into Yellowstone. Well, what he's doing is taking this pristine area and you'll see like trucks in the very, very background going through the highway and you'll see these like definite, you know, signs of human life are, are more contemporary, like bridges and pillars and things. And um, in his work really uh, to me is saying, here's where the past and the present converge, you know, mm -hmm. um, if Moran were to come out to the West today as a brand new, I've never been out here. This is really what he would see, you know, and, and oh, I love that. Yeah. And Don <laughs> isn't, and Don isn't like hitting you over the head with, Hey, shape up America. What he's saying is this is, this is what the land is now. But mm -hmm. he's also act actually suggesting that, you know, we kind of need to pay attention because this is all going to get paved over if if we're not careful. And if we don't really look back at what Thomas Moran was able to do to persuade Congress and people to say, this is very important. This is important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is important. Awesome. Yeah. Karen Kitchell is another one of those artists. Um, you can see both of these artists in many museums across the country in the Denver Art Museum, for sure. Their work is up right now. Um, Karen Kitchell, a lot of her seminal work is on grasses and weeds um, and um, invasive plants. And I know this doesn't sound very romantic <laughs> um, or, or maybe something that would be artwork, but actually the way she does it, it's stunning and they're gorgeous. And, and there are these paintings that when you get into them, you're like, oh, that grass is killing off the indigenous grass. That's, that's really a nasty invasive species that was introduced mm -hmm. by these settlers and it's spread, you know? So it, again, it's artists who are taking their craft and their ability to make things really beautiful um, to to suck us in as, as um, visitors. And then once we're there, start to ask questions. Mm -hmm. And then when you know things are happening, you can decide to make a change or make things better, right? So. Mm -hmm. No, I love the subtle messaging that like art is able to do without, like you said, hitting your yeah. head against it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Create. Yeah you know, the visual is there, create the narrative yourself, but it's definitely there, but I'm not going to stand on a soapbox to get it to you. 
Well, no one listens anyway, right? No one listens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, re it reminds me of uh, an artist friend of mine, a Navajo um, woman who is, she's head of um, printmaking at CU, uh, Melanie Ozzie, just an incredible, incredible artist. And years ago when she was in college um, and just starting out, she was, she said, oh, she said, I was so angry and I was just creating all this angry art and I wanted people to understand what my child who was like what my life was like and and what it is to be a native american person in this land today and she said one day she realized that that everybody who was angry was with her they were mm -hmm. already there and everybody else was like it's just another native another angry native mm -hmm. and so she changed her approach and um now what she does is she tells stories in her work and it's, and it's, again, that idea of using her past symbols um, and, and really important um, aspects of her upbringing and her Native American culture and heritage and putting them out there in this incredibly beautiful form. Um, and, and then also teaching and just sharing her art with everybody um, that draws people in and then starts a conversation, you mm -hmm. know, and, and I think that, I mean, at, personally, as a curator, I definitely don't want to shut down anybody's conversation, but I am somebody who really believes that uh, really, if we can put work out there in front of people, that's important and poignant and on the surface, just absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. And if I just watch people at exhibits, just, it's almost like there's just this big magnet that's sucking them into it. And the next <laughs> yeah. thing you know, they're like, they're looking around for somebody to talk to them. They need to talk about it. Like they just got yeah. out of this really incredible film and they want someone to talk about it. You know, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's what really good art of the West can do. I think. I love that. One of my favorites that has done that for me many a time is our good friend, Willie Matthews. I know yes. he's done a lot for Western art. And I feel like every time I see his pieces at the Coors Western, I, I feel like I'm, it's a film like what you were talking about. Oh yeah. Yeah. And you know what, here's the thing about Willie. I think Willie is one of those great um, bridge. I call him a bridge because <laughs> he is painting almost traditional Western subject matter. The thing is, every cowboy he paints, every building, every scene, the cattle, the horses, they're all living, working today. Mm -hmm. This is, he is not making it up. I mean, he is a fantastic painter. And again, there's this gorgeous painting in front of you that you're like, wow, wow. I, I just love that. It makes me feel good. Like people who love Western art, that's what I want. Right. Mm -hmm. And for me as a curator who's trying to have a show that's talking about the West today, mm -hmm. and that's important. Right. Um, Willie Matthews is one of those artists that soothes everybody because mm -hmm. it's it is traditional subject matter. It's incredibly well done. Um, but it's also he's also talking about, in particular, these men, these cowboys who are a dying breed. Mm -hmm. you know? And that's um, the thing, you know, when we talk about preservation of the West, artists mm -hmm. like Willie, and I know you'll mention a couple others, but mm -hmm. it's another type of preservation because it's, pre it's highlighting kind of what these working landscapes, what the trials and tribulations are, how hard of an industry, how hard of a job that is, yeah. but also romanticizing it because it is, it's this beautiful part of our culture in the West that I think a lot of people, especially those who are moving to Denver, who don't quite understand what it means um, to be the West. It's a way to highlight that and educate people in something that everyone can kind of absorb. Um, so I think that's yeah. neat about him. Well, it, it, you know what? And, and I think you and I, Haley, have talked about this too, is, is that, you know, you get a lot of people who um, stalk their dinner down the grocery aisles, right? And they don't mm -hmm. really realize, you know, where their meat comes from, where the lettuce and the corn and the asparagus and 
you know, these are, this is even dairy, the dairy industry, my goodness, that is just mm -hmm. such a hardworking um, bunch of people. I, it's, it's just hard to fathom the hours they put in and the backbreaking work. And it's still being done today. It's, it's not automated the way that I think people think it is. Um, yeah. And the people who are doing this work really choose it. This is a life mm -hmm. they want, you know. Yeah. And, and speaking of, of artists, I, I love to point out Don Cohen, who's an artist in his 80s. He was born and raised in Lamar on a ranch that his father and uncle shared together. And they cleared that land. The entire family, you know, cleared the land of rocks and, and they plowed it with horses um, Don, until he was um, 12 years old, they didn't have plumbing or electricity in their house. Wow. He, rode a, he rode a horse to school, um, you know, in this one room schoolhouse. And um, <laughs> in, yeah. And so Don's work is just incredible. It's in, it's in the Denver Art Museum. It's in museums around the world as well. And he has a series that is traveling the United States of migrant workers. And um, he grew up working next to migrant workers because that's mm -hmm. you know, when the harvest came in, you needed migrant workers. And um, he did this incredible series of paintings about them just to not to make this big political statement, but really to say, you know, just this is where your food comes from. These, mm -hmm. these are the unsung, you know, heroes of it. You know, these are the people who are breaking their back every day who live in these migrant, literal migrant camps and move from, mm -hmm. you know, melons to apples to grapes harvest, you know, across the country. What What's the name of that show? For those? Uh, the Migrant Series. The Migrant okay. Series. I'll yeah. have to, is it coming to Denver at all or is that... Uh, so it was in the springs uh, about two years ago and before okay. that it originated in um, Phoenix um, and you know what it's worth I think it'll be on Don's website um, you okay. can find out where it's going to be next but perfect but, well, yeah. we'll highlight that after this that's yeah. so neat and I I mean and I know you've mentioned a lot of artists Willie I know is a part of course but mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of these people, they might not be necessarily highlighted in the core show, but um, there are a ton of incredible artists and we can't really go through all of them in this live stream. But do you mind telling us a little bit for those of uh, those of you who are listening, kind of what your job is with the Coors Western, mm -hmm. kind of what this show embodies, why it was created, um, mm -hmm. and then kind of how you've chosen the people or the artists that are in the show? Yeah, for sure. So the show is kind of unique because um, we're under the umbrella of the National Western Stock Show. So we are um, a nonprofit and the proceeds from sales at our show, ticket sales, table sales, art sales, goes to the National Western Scholarship Trust. And the trust gives out 100 scholarships a year to kids who are studying in universities, uh, um, and colleges in Colorado and Wyoming. They're studying agribusiness, animal husbandry, rural family health, nursing, um, veterinary science, and, and a number of other degrees. They then go back to their small rural communities to live and work. Um, and so I always love to tell people, um, one, we are the biggest contributor every year uh, proceeds mm -hmm. from the core show. I'm quite proud of that. And <laughs> that is, that's a huge accomplishment. <laughs> yeah. And two, um, we are literally keeping the West alive. Like mm -hmm. a lot of these kids write to us and they say they could not, their parents could not have afforded to put them through college. Um, yeah. so we're really They're incredible. Yeah. And I, it's, and I, what you do in young guns, is a mm -hmm. hold a special place in my heart. I've been on the young guns for probably way too many years, but uh, just the ability, I mean, meeting some of these recipients through what the show has done is really impactful and incredible just to, to see that the next generation of agribusiness and agricultural entre entrepreneurs is still alive and well and 
towards Western and uh, is doing a huge part in saving that. Um, and not only protecting kind of that industry and those scholarships, but you've done an incredible job of educating Denver and kind of this this population of people about the West and Western art through the pieces that you've curated. Um, oh, well, so I would, I, yeah. And I'd love to know just kind of your process of, yep. you know, why you've, you've chosen who you've chosen throughout the years. It can be mm -hmm. broad. You don't know how to have to be specific, but kind well, of where I'll have you started? You, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell you kind of a funny story. When I started 27 years ago, that we were this tiny little show, 32 artists. We now have 75. Um, wow. And uh, yeah, and there was a cash box at the front and I had two volunteers and they would handwrite a receipt to you. I mean, it was just really, really just very mellow. Um, and now it's this huge shindig and bunch of parties and previews and all kinds of stuff. Um, but when I started, uh, there were people who really wanted these traditional cowboy artists and who are quite pricey. And, and I invited them knowing they would say no. And they did because we were like, who are you? And they yeah. said, click, you know, uh, yeah. yeah, no, no, I'm not doing that. I don't have time for you. I don't have time. <laughs> yeah. So I really started with artists that I believed in. Um, I asked some very well-known artists who were friends of mine um, from okay. my work in the gallery business. And they said, oh, sure, I'll help you out. And um, using their name to attract other artists helped me really build the show. Um, but the other thing I knew as I, as I looked around the landscape, and there are exhibitions that are held in beautiful museum settings and we are at the stock show and um it smells like a horse barn in there it just i does. love it <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's very i mean it's a very different vibe it's a different look it's a different feel um mm -hmm. and i thought you know what um we're gonna have to carve our own path i'm going to find artists that i know are good that are promising um, and I'm going to build a show out of them. And I am so proud to say that a lot of the artists who um, I was able to find and other artists told me about are really prominent artists today. And mm -hmm. they got their start at the Coors show. And, and that's been and continues to be something that I try to do every year is bring completely unknown artists into the show. And mm -hmm. I think that's part of what my audience has come to love. Like I'll hear mm -hmm. people outside of the show say, oh, I discovered this artist at the Coors show. And I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, you did. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And for yeah. those of you, uh, for those of us, you know, Young Guns is special because it allows a younger generation to become Western art collectors. Mm -hmm. um, it has uh, some pieces of maybe artists that aren't necessarily in the show that we can learn about and those kinds of things. But then on a broader scale, um, for those who are interested in going to the Coors Western or want to just see the show when the stock show is in town, what do you recommend just starting? You know, like like you said, I, 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 I learned about this artist through the Coors. Mm -hmm. What do you recommend? What are kind of steps in those who are trying to start a collection and and, and uh, invest in something like that? You know, I would say the tips that I always give people when they're looking at starting to buy art, and, and let's face it, buying art is intimidating, right? Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. You know, especially when you compare it to, you know, buying a painting to, um, you know, a few car payments or, or things like that, right? So, mm -hmm. um, so I like to try and help people get over some of those fears of, well, I'm, I'm buying something that is going to have no value. Um, it, it, and, and people always say, well, how do I invest in art? And so one of my first and biggest tips is don't look at it as investing in art. The mm -hmm. reality of buying art is that um, if you go to resell art, uh, especially within a few years of buying it, you're going to lose money on it. 
because you're going to have to pay somebody to sell it for you. Um, and you're going to pay them a commission for selling it. So, okay. so, so tip number two, I would say, oof, and I always put a big asterisk by this, <laughs> buy what you love. Um, and the reason why I say, but uh, is because, <laughs> <laughs> because I always ask people when they say, well, yeah, I know Rose, buy what I love. Right. And I'm like, yeah, but what do you love? And they're like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, they can't put a, put a finger on it. You can't put a frame around it in a sense. So, so I would say buy what you love, but, it, but you need to know what you love and to know what you love. You just really have to go to art exhibits mm -hmm. um, and, and, and you just have to be there. So I will say like at the core show, um, I give people every opportunity to come on a curator talk. I do talks all the time. You know, Haley, if you were to call and say, hey, I've got five people. Will you give us a give us a little tour around the gallery? Absolutely. When do you want me to be there? Um, mm -hmm. and, and just completely free of charge. Right. I just want you to come. I'm going to tell you about the art. I'm going to tell you stories about it. I'm going to tell you who the artists are. I'm going to tell you why I picked them. And so for somebody who, you know, you're you're selling ranches, you know, other people are. Um, in oil and gas, other people are in banking, whatever. Art's not the thing you do every day, all day. It's what I right. do every day, all day. <laughs> yeah. so, so I would say, I would say my big tip is go look at art, but also when you do that, try and go look at art when a curator can be there to give you a tour and talk to you about stuff or a gallerist, you know, find mm -hmm. a gallery that you love what they have. So already you're gonna love what that dealer is looking at. And that dealer is gonna be an expert in those artists and that style and that era and all of that kind of stuff. Um, because what's gonna happen is like what I can do for you is you and I could walk through and you could say, well, I'd really like to buy a Willie Matthews painting and I can say, I've got five of them in the show. And if you can swing it, here's the best one. And this one belongs in a museum collection. So mm -hmm. honestly, Haley, I would tell you to buy that one and hang on to it. And uh, museums will probably call you to borrow it. That's mm -hmm. going to be a really important piece, right? That's, and, and, I, and what's so great about the shows that are coming up the red carpet show and the young gun show is you'll yep. be there. Yeah. But in addition, artists will be there, which artists will is a whole there. other element. And obviously they will be a little bit more biased on their pieces, but uh, nonetheless, it's good to have, you know, some backstory to what you're looking at. Well, that's, that is a hundred percent true. And the, and the thing about talking to the artists about their work um, is that you can ask them just specific questions and um, some of the questions you should ask artists to help educate yourself is, I'll tell you, don't ask them how long it took them to do something. <laughs> okay. Everything just takes different amount of time. Some things just flow in a day. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like that runner's high idea where, where you've just been going all day and, and all of a sudden you look and it's midnight and you're like, oh my God, I had the best day of my life. And that's how a good day in the studio is other paintings or sculptures or whatever you fight for years mm -hmm. and you may end up destroying them at the end. So is one painting worth less because it took you hours to do versus the other that took you a decade to do? No, it's not. So that's a good ask, tip. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So don't, don't ask. ask, don't ask that one. What I really suggest people ask artists is, for the story behind the art. What mm -hmm. inspired this painting? What inspired this work? When you ask them that, what you're going to discover is why something is a pinnacle piece. So you've probably heard people talk about, oh, Picasso's blue period, you know, mm -hmm. like they'll jokingly say it in a, in movies and stuff. Well, 
that was a series of paintings that Picasso did, and they are worth millions and millions of dollars if they ever come up at auction, right? Right. So what, what you can do as a new collector or as a seasoned collector is talk to artists and say, what's going on with this work? You know, um, there's an artist in our show who um, went through a number of very, very tragic um, experiences in her family. And the work she did after she kind of started to come out of that, um, and I don't think ever will fully recover from it, that work is so poignant and so powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in fact, that work, uh, she calls it self-portraits. They're all of oh, horses. Oh, I'm so excited to see it. Yeah, that's Oh, they're all of horses. Yeah, they're all okay. horses, but they're self-portraits. So, so what? So what I'm saying is work like that, and that's Soapy Brown I'm talking about. But with work like that, it goes beyond. I'm just painting horses. Now the horse mm -hmm. is a vehicle. The horse is a metaphor for mm -hmm. really deep emotion, um, and and just really working through things. And those, she's not the only one who has that depth of emotion, right? And, and I will tell you with Sophie's work in particular, um, I have watched people come in to the gallery, joking around, looking around, and all of a sudden walk up to that work and they're just struck. They're just struck mm -hmm. dumb. They can't speak and they don't know what's going on exactly, but something's going on that's incredibly powerful. And so that I, I would say is my, is my fourth big tip is when you go to look at art, um, allow yourself to feel it inside of you. And, and that mm -hmm. doesn't mean you're going to feel everything. And I know this sounds a little airy fairy to some people, um, but it happens, right? I, I mean, like, mm -hmm. think about it if you're going to buy a car. Um, you know, or, or some, a ranch, <laughs> yeah, or a ranch, right? They're, like yeah. some things happen when you walk into, into a, a land and you're like, Oh, that's, that's pretty. Other times you'll walk into a place, uh, you know, and you'll be like, Oh my God, I feel like I've been here mm -hmm. before. What's happening to me right now? Yeah. It's that there's something that's happening there. Um, and, and what I would tell people, pay attention when that happens. And it's not going to happen to everything. You can walk mm -hmm. in and just be unmoved. Um, and, and you can also, Haley, you and I can walk into an exhibit and you'll go up to something and be like, whoa. And I'll be like, mm -hmm. what you should see is over here. My <laughs> experience is happening over there. Yours is happening over here that's perfectly fine. But, yeah. but what I would say is allow yourself to go look at art and let the art speak to you in, mm -hmm. in whatever way it does. And not everything will, but when it does pay attention um, mm -hmm. because you're actually having this interesting connection with another person who isn't in the room. Right. And that's, cool. it's funny you say that because that's kind of, that Ken, we are not curators of art. We will never say we are curators of art, yeah. but that's kind of how we feel with selling ranches. We feel like we're selling fine art because it's very similar. It's this, yeah. you can't explain it. Not every property or piece is for anyone, but you always know the minute you see it. And that's what I think is so special about what you do is you create those moments for everyone. So, yeah. and I'm, yeah, and I'm super excited because, uh, I know, you know, you put a lot of work into it. I know you came just from the studio to do this <laughs> with us or to, yeah. from the show to do this with us. I know you're very busy right now. So we really appreciate the time. Um, is there anything else you would like, uh, to, to plug before I kind of, uh, let you off? Give it a wrap. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know what, you know what I would tell people? Cause people do always ask how I select the artist. Always, always. And um, it's, it, there isn't like an A plus B divided by C square root pi. What, you know, the, I like it's, I can't just give them the steps because it's always different. 
but I am looking for kind of specific things when I'm talking to artists. And so um, I, what I would say is I also write about these things on my website. So rosefrederick.com. And I have a blog that I call the incurable optimist. And I, I write <laughs> the incurable optimist. So <laughs> I write about um, how art is priced, for example. Mm -hmm. I write about how to light art in your home and, and protect it um, so that you don't destroy wow. pieces of art. Um, you know, I write about um, art etiquette, you know, like what you, you can and can't say to artists. Um, and, and so, and, and then I also write about curating and working with artists and I interview artists. I have an interview I did with Wayne Tebow, um, who just died last year at, uh, age 100, you know, so wow. that's on my website. And, um, so there's a lot more of the specifics of how I find artists, um, how you can find artists and how to look for art. But I would certainly say, the Young Guns is an is a um, uh, a group, and uh, we have a great exhibition and um, uh, event set up in, next week with that. That's coming up. It's a really fun event to come to. We talk about how to collect art there. We give um, if you're in our age group, you get first dibs on buying <laughs> some of those. <laughs> Yeah, some of those artists that I have discovered who uh, nobody knows of yet. Uh, so yeah. they're, yeah, so good prices on that work. And um, they are artists that I have vetted and I'm standing behind. I feel confident that they're going to continue on and have really good solid careers. So you can buy something from them now and know that that is going to be a good quote unquote investment. So love that. And then the yeah. big event is the yeah. red carpet one. I know that's not till January. Yeah. Um, so uh, we'll be First, sure after this to get all oh, those good. links for everyone because it's important. Um, thank you. But I just, I just wanted to thank you. I know again, you're so busy, but I really have appreciated getting to know you through the years through Young Guns and then just through your work at Coors Western and they're lucky to have you. So we're really excited for this year. <laughs> and Thanks, I've already Haley. like, I, I haven't saved as much as I probably should have before the event next week, but I should be able to buy at least something. <laughs> Good. Oh, we can work it out for you, Haley. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> Maybe we'll do a payment plan. Awesome. Well, thank you yeah. so much, Rose. And I look forward to seeing you next week. All right, Haley. Thank you for asking me. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys. Take care. Thanks so much. See ya. You're welcome. And for those of you who tuned in, we will send links after this. Be sure to get your tickets for the Young Gun Show next week or the Red Carpet event in January. And if you do decide to go to those or just watch the show when it comes to the National Western, be sure to go to Rose's website, rosefrederick.com, and read her blog because it really is in insightful, gives you a lot of tips on how to become a, uh, a collector of Western art and then how to protect your art once you have it. Um, if you wanna learn more about us, be sure to subscribe to our newsletter on our website at www.meritranchgroup.com or give us a call at 303-623-4545. Thanks so much. See you next time. <laughs>